All right, so we are going to continue from our in-person class that was earlier this week. And the first slide is, uh, I'm just going to do a little slight, tiny bit of a recap. Uh, all right, so remember this slide, uh, which, well, the whole thing is going to be posted later on this week. Uh, and uh, well, you can analyze it on your own with this video as well. So anyways, I remember that slide from our in-person lecture uh, that uh, we have analyzed, the, we have analyzed the impedance or the, well, rather reactants of the capacitor versus the inductor. Now uh, we have point, we have looked at uh, something that's called a resonant frequency. And just as a recap, a resonant frequency is that when the magnitude of the reactants is equal to the magnitude of the reactants. Which reactances are we talking about? Uh, so the capacitive reactance is as uh, as big as the um, inductive reactants. Uh, so, for example, uh, if, you get, if you get two values for these two values of the capacitor, so be a capacitance of uh, 100 microfarads. And the inductance of the inductor would be uh, 100 milli henries. Uh, so um, I'll just get this here. Uh, so uh, in in this case, um, the um, the reactants the reactances are equal. Right? Now, just keep in mind that the reactances are equal in magnitude, but not with the direction of the vector. Now, what we're going to uh, look at is the next slide that we had seen. If you remember this, uh, here is the circuit that we had. And in series, we had the resistor just to limit the current. Uh, so we have something controllable to deal with. And then over here, we have the capacitor and we have the inductor in series. And we have here the, well, power supply, which would be the AC power supply with a certain frequency that we have. Notice that uh, the voltages are on across those two, um, across these two components are uh, 180 degrees phase shifted. They're out of phase. So at the time that the um, inductor peaks positively, the capacitor would peak negatively. And remember the relationship between resistance and, um, and voltage. If the resistance goes up, the voltage goes up across the component. And if the resistance goes down, it is less, then we're going to have, excuse me, <coughs> we're going to have less voltage dissipated across that element comparing to the other elements. Uh, of course, um, all the voltages we're going to have to add at any given moment, all right? Any snapshot in time, all the voltages are going to be equal to whatever the voltage at the moment is presented. If you just, it's just like a freeze moment, right? <coughs> excuse me. So, um, now, if we look at the, if we were just dealing with the pure DC, then uh, we're going to have no directions as far as vectors. Okay. Now, notice, remember that uh, when we are talking about the uh, inductor, on the inductor, because the inductors do not like change. So when the change is uh, drastically presented to the inductor, the inductor is going to prevent the current from flowing, which means it's going to present a lot of resistance. And because of the resistance is presented, then we're going to have voltage at that moment across the inductor. The capacitor is just the opposite. So now we have two opposite sine waves or cosine waves. Well, form is called sine wave. Uh, now, when we deal with the resonant frequency, the magnitudes of during that frequency, when the frequency hap when we adjust the frequency applied to both elements, the magnitudes of the reactances are going to be the same, but they are going to point in opposite directions. So remember these here, the reactants, so voltage happens first on the coil or inductor. 
and voltage so so if the voltage happens first then it must have a lot of resistance or a lot of reactance at that moment because the voltage is there the capacitor is just the opposite see here just the opposite so what is going to happen to this vector this one here because here remember this is the sum of the reactances and it's either going to be pointing this way if the load is inductive or it's going to point this way if the load is capacitive but what if these two are equal right like right here at this point at this frequency when the two reactances are equal these two are going to cancel each other so then we're going to have a resonant frequency at the resonant frequency these two are going to be equal in magnitude but they're going to be pointing at different directions so what is going to be what is this going to look like here well this is going to come down right to zero because they're going to cancel each other so if you have a circuit like this at the resonant frequency one reactance is going to be pointing one way the other reactance is going to point the other way they're going to cancel each other so it's just as if these two at that frequency just as if these two don't exist we can just substitute that with just a straight wire so that is the resonant uh, <coughs> excuse me at the resonant frequency and this phenomenon is very useful when designing filters and things that are similar to that right okay so that was just a recap from the last class uh last uh, theory lecture here um let me just get to the point all right so that was the last slide and uh, when we were talking about the characteristic impedance of whatever it is and in this case we were talking about the coaxial cable so uh, remember uh, the question was will the characteristic impedance change if the total length of the coaxial link changes and of course we have established that no because the characteristic impedance does not depend on the length of the cable it depends on other characteristics um, and for the most part it is equal to the first meter of that cable and then uh, also as a recap here uh, why do we need to match the impedances as we interface different parts of the whole transmission system so if we are transferring signal from one piece of equipment to another piece of equipment so that could be a transmitter and this could be a link or a cable those the impedances so the impedance the output impedance of a transmitter has to be equal to the characteristic impedance of the cable and why here's the here's the key thing why and uh, as i explained that to you the answer is um well for the reasons of maximum power transfer okay all right now let's let's uh, just take a quick look at some of the coaxial cable applications right now I remember we talked about a few different RGs and RG stands for radio guide and this, these numbers here RG59, RG6, RG11 they have nothing to do with the, any kind of specifications they are just uh, consider them as names because when the engineers were coming up with different types of cables for different purposes one is better slightly for one purpose and the other one for another another purpose <coughs> excuse me uh then uh, the cables would slightly differ from each other uh, so they would just grab those numbers and they would number them here's the rg59 here's the rg6 here's rg11 and and uh, based on those designations those numbers or rather well you can treat them as names uh, then the cables would have uh, certain characteristics or certain specifications All right now let's take a look at the well rg6 first i'm going to take a look at that and that and this one here so rg6 uh, and the reason why I, uh, I i i chose this rg6 first is because um this would be the cable that you would see um at your home if you have the internet uh, excuse me, internet provided um, in the means of cable. So that would be the cable. 
uh, uh, that would be the RG6 cable, and that would be the, the shape and the thickness of that cable. So you you should be quite familiar with that. All right. Then um, the RG59 is slightly thinner, and the RG11 is uh, well, it's a much thicker cable, and then the RG58 is somewhere close to thickness of the RG59. Notice that I'm talking RG, not RJ. RJ is completely something different. RJ is stands for registered jack, and this would be the well, telephone jacks or Ethernet jacks. Now we're talking about RGs, and the RG stands for radio guide, which applies to the coaxial cable. All right, so uh, what would be the applications for RG6? For the most part, it would be the cable television, and uh, this would be mostly in the past. However, you might see in some parts of the world still being used, and uh, in some parts of our country, which is small, well, we're in Canada, uh, you still might see some of the um, cable television provided by that, but uh, it's becoming less and less. Also, it is used in something that's called closed circuit television system um, now for the most part uh, these days uh, that cctv is taken care of by the means of the ethernet cable uh, so the signal is slightly different uh, but uh, it was also you can still see some of the signal provided by the coaxial cable to certain cameras uh, well, so some of the older uh, closed circuit television systems, which, you know, it's then basically is the uh, security cameras right, or camera surveillance, video surveillance systems. Uh, the video signal uh, from the camera, sometimes it's still being uh, provided uh, by the um, RG6, although... Um, um, you would rather see, mostly would see the um, RG59, but still in some applications that the video signal has been provided by the uh, coaxial cable. Again, you will see less and less of that, but still you may encounter some of the older systems that, uh, that still imply the uh, CCTV uh, video signal is uh, provided from the camera to whatever the control equipment by the coaxial cable, uh, which means that you're going to have um, two cables going to the camera. One cable was going to provide the power and the other cable is going to be the coaxial cable, which provides the, um, well, um, video signal. And sometimes you're going to see something that's called a Siamese cable, which is basically one package, one cable, uh, here, one cable uh, that contains two cables inside uh, the big jacket thing. Uh, they're kind of like molded together and one is coaxial and attached to it is, um, well, uh, two conductor, mostly stranded, uh, conduct, uh, stranded um, veins inside uh, <clears throat> that provide the power, right? Now, application for that, internet, and in orange here, I uh, wrote broadband. We're going to talk about what this is. So that's why I put that in orange. So next couple, next few slides, we're going to talk about uh, the differences between broadband and baseband. Uh, it is important that you distinguish the differences and uh, between those uh, two. All right. uh, RG6 also is used for providing the signal to the antennas. Okay, now the frequency limit, uh, which would be the bandwidth, um, uh, the frequency limit of that <coughs> is, uh, and now you see here, it says 1000 megahertz. And in brackets, I put one gigahertz. Okay. The reason why I put, thousand megahertz is because in the field of telecommunications uh, when it comes to this topic uh, quite often you're going to hear the frequencies um, expressed in megahertz although technically yes it is correct that thousand megahertz is one gigahertz but quite often you're going to hear the um, you're going to see the frequencies expressed in megahertz it just kind of stayed that way, right? And here's the thing that we talked about last time. 
the characteristic impedance of that is 75 ohms. Now, same thing with the RG59. It was used for network cabling in the past. That would be, remember when I was, was talking about the bus type of bus configuration. Uh, with the tabs, uh, instead of the star topology, we used to use something that's called a bus topology, and there would be one pretty much main bus consisting of a coaxial cable going from one computer to another, to another, to another, and from those, we would connect the tabs that would tap into the main bus. Uh, and uh, the signal will be provided to the computer. And this was up till, well, early 90s, okay? And then uh, the Ethernet type of star topology was implemented and it stayed that way. Uh, video signal mostly in the past. So that has something to do with also with the CCTV and amateur radio. It is still in use, although, uh, more often than not, uh, to provide the signal from the transmitter to the antenna, uh, the RG58 is being used because uh, that has to do with the output impedance of the transmitter. And some of the transmitters are 75 ohms and some of the transmitters are 50 ohms, or most of them. Uh, then uh, you would have to use RG58 instead of RG59 because you have to match the impedances. Okay? of the transmitter and the cable, right? So uh, RG58 is mostly used in the uh, radio, amateur radio, to provide the signal to the antennas for the most part. Now, uh, the differences between these two here, RG59 and RG58, um, well, they are pretty much the same as far as the bandwidth. So why have two of those? Well, this one is going to be less expensive, but also there's a trade-off for the money because um, the RG6 cable will carry the signal further without, um, further with less attenuation, which would be the signal deterioration as the waveform travels through the cable. And this would be for shorter distances. Uh, well, it's less expensive. The thing is that if you use just a three feet of cable or five feet of cable, or maybe 20 feet or even a hundred feet, the price is not going to be that much different. However, in larger installations, when you use thousands of feet, then it adds up. So that's uh, how, um, well, that's why we have these two here. Now, RG11, you can see that here now. Uh, it is a much thicker cable. It's more expensive to produce because it, well, it is more expensive. Uh, it was used mostly for the cable television, same, uh, same uh, kind of application here, CCTV, and it's used for broadband signal for the internet antennas and now let's look let's look at this thing here frequency limit is you can got a greater bandwidth uh what's the frequency limit it's the um how um how high you can crank the frequency of a signal being transmitted and so the signal is still being understood by, by whatever receives it on the other end. Okay, so uh, if we wanted to um, transmit higher frequencies through one of the cables that is higher, those frequencies will be higher than is specified, then there's a chance that the signal is just going to be so muddy that it's going to be not understood. It's going to be well, not seen properly on the other end. This one here has better capabilities when it comes to the uh, frequency bandwidth. Characteristic impedance also 75 ohms. So these 75 ohms, 75 ohms, 75 ohms, RG59, RG6, RG11. Why would we want to use sometimes the RG11? Well, it would be, um, let me just get the, uh, uh, the board here. So if there will be, uh, let's say, big um, distribution amplifier, all right, so it'd be a RF, RF amplifier. 
which would contain maybe, uh, let's say, a bunch of television channels that would be the, in the past. But that's, I just wanted to kind of give you the visual. The main signal coming out of the amplifier, we would use RG11. Okay. Because uh, it has less attenuation as well. We're going to analyze that. Right? Uh, then from there, we would just put taps. Okay. We would put taps that would be tapping into that. And from there, we would go to whatever receiver uh, is at the other end. Okay. So uh, and over here, we could use RG6, all right? RG6. Uh, because from here to here, there would be not as much of a distance and we don't need to carry as much signal. And this would be the main bus. So you wanna keep the integrity of the signal as much as you can. Uh, and sometimes this would be carried for longer distances. So uh, so we would use RG11 for that. And then we would just tap in with RG6. Now, because of the impedances uh, uh, are the same, so we would not have any signal bouncing back to the transmitter or we would not have any kind of trouble at the top because the impedances are the same. Uh, so we could have a happy situation this way. All right? uh, so RG11 uh, and then uh, internet uh, again, broadband, all right, broadband internet. Uh, the internet can be provided by RG6, the internet can be provided by RG11. Uh, so as a summary of these four cables, uh, there's a bandwidth that RG59 and RG6 um, have pretty much the same bandwidth. However, the RG6 can carry the signal over longer distances then RG11 can carry the signal even longer distances, even further without being deteriorated. Plus it has a better bandwidth. Okay. And then there's the RG58, uh, which um, well, has similar bandwidth to, well, frequency limit is 5,000 megahertz. So five gigahertz, so it's even better than the RG11, uh, but the attenuation is close to the RG59. So you see, when you apply uh, different cables for different purpose, uh, you're going to have to consider some specifications and uh, the purpose of the uh, what basically what it has to do. Now, I included a link here. I'm not going to click on that. If you want to know more, uh, why do we have 50 ohms? Uh, I found a pretty good video that explains that. So if you really want to know more, if this is something that excites you, go ahead and dig further and there is no end to it. Right? Now, well, here, uh, let's get to the next page. See, we have uh, RG59, RG6, and RG11, just as a comparison here. Now, uh, excuse me, what do we see here? Uh, we see the frequencies, and here's a five megahertz, 55. So as the table goes down, the frequencies increase. See here, at the, at the in the beginning of the of this column, we have just five megahertz, and look over here, we have uh, 3,500 megahertz. So there's a big jump. All right. Now, here's RG59, here's RG6, and here's RG11. And we're talking about attenuation. What's attenuation? It's basically um, the deterioration of the signal as it travels down the pipes. And what I mean by the pipes, I mean by the, um, well, the coaxial cable in the, our case. <clears throat> Remember when I explained to you when the transmitter inserts a signal into a coaxial cable, it's inserts in the form of wave. So it's just shoves it in there and leaves it on it all on its own and the signal travels as in a waveform. So as it travels further down the road, uh, down the road, it is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller to the point that we're going to reach the limit of the signal that the signal is going to be so little uh, that it's not recognizable as signal anymore, right? So that's the attenuation. 
And if we analyze these columns for RG59, 6, and 11, now, it is the attenuation of how many decibels is the signal going to deteriorate per 100 feet? Or for our convenience also, it's listed as per 100 meters. Let's just forget the 100 meters or the meters thing. Let's just concentrate on the feet because, well, uh, it is going to pretty much be the same uh, for meters, except the numbers are going to be different, right? Right now, what's uh, there's that thing. See, whenever I explain something, um, I leave uh, I leave something else uh, that is kind of unknown, and well, there could be no end for me to explain and explain and explain um, further and further. However, uh, decibels we have a decibel scale in order to better represent some quantities visually right? because sometimes the span of the quantities of the span of the values is so huge that we would have to have a very long sheet of paper in order to show some of the differences uh, if we want to explain if you want to graph some things so this decibel scales helps us to condense uh, some of the visuals and see things better. Right? Uh, so that's explanation in a short. Right? Now, a decibel also is a, um, there's no an absolute value of decibels. And what I mean by that is a decibel is a referential value. So if you see things like a dB, it is, um, something compared to some other reference and let me just see if i can uh, quickly explain that i don't want to go too deep into that because we don't have that much time uh, let me just erase this uh, uh, thing here and of course it gave us the orange background. There you go. Now we're back to white background here. Um, the decibels. A dB measurement is equal to 10 log times log of the value, I guess put a value of uh, at hand that we have and uh, divided by the value of reference when it comes to power. The B equals. When it comes to voltage, then uh, the dB value is equal to 20 yeah. instead of 10. Somebody's got their microphone turned on. I think it's look. Thank you. Or, uh, yeah, you, want, you might want to turn the microphone off. Right. Uh, so the B equals to 20 log There you go. Uh, 20 log of whatever the V uh, value of, um, well, value of whatever we have at hand divided by the value of reference. So this will be the power and this will be the voltage. Okay, these are a couple of formulas that um, I'm not going to test you on, but just so you know where the dBs come from. Also, uh, in a very, very short explanation here, when it comes to power, if you raise the power three decibels, you have doubled the power. If you lower the power of the signal three decibels, you have cut the power in half. So if you have uh, 100 watts, you raise it three dB, you end up with 200 watts. 
then you got that 200 watts you raise it 3 db you get 400 watts see and that 400 watts you raise it 3 db you got 800 watts so that's how it works um so that when it comes to power just so you remember that it's a quick thing to remember uh then uh, when it comes to voltages and you might study some of that too then the value is six right so if you double the voltage you have raised the voltage six decibels right? instead of three for the power so that's how it works okay so let's see what uh, what's happening here rg59 uh the attenuation at five megahertz per 100 feet is 0 0.89 decibels and we're talking about power of the signal and you can see as the frequency goes up the signal is going to be attenuated more so that's for rg59 now rg6 let's just take a look at this uh, five megahertz for example frequency it doesn't attenuate the, the signal as much per 100 feet and rg11 is you can tell it's better performing cable because it attenuates even less so the signal can for travel further in rg11 and in rg6 and definitely in rg59 also what you can tell in all three instances <clears throat> we have something that you can notice as the frequency goes up the signal doesn't have as much power of well traveling further so this frequency higher frequencies do not have as much punch power as they travel they are they are get attenuated more than the lower frequencies right. you can look at this table as you download and you can you, you can just tell right. so there are the two <coughs> excuse me two uh things that i'm showing you here rg59 is the lowest of them all then it's rg6 and then there's rg11 of course the prices vary accordingly when it comes to that and as the frequency goes up the signal is um well attenuated more all right there we go now for the uh for the for explanation of uh, of some kind of like a practical um, visual if i can if, if i can call it that they used to the tvs used to be divided into channels so uh channel uh channel two of the uh, cable television that used to be would occupy the frequencies of the carrier we have the carrier frequency uh between uh 54 and 60 megahertz okay Notice there's six megahertz that every channel will occupy. 60 and 66, 66, 72. So as the channels go up, but notice the channels, as the channels go up, the frequencies go higher because they have to be somewhere right, within the spectrum. And we're not going to take a look at this. In general television frequencies, that is for your, you know, uh, borderline historical reference right but i'm just explaining you the phenomenon well, the phenomenons that happen uh with the cable tv i'm going somewhere with that trust me All right now here is something that's called a distribution amplifier let's analyze quickly some of the inputs outputs and the controls here is a like for example for the cable tv and you can still see some of that implemented in some of the schools. For the most part, the schools would be, uh, yeah. Uh, with televisions distributed, television signal distributed to different classrooms. Uh, so let's say there is a there is a signal, cable TV signal coming 
or it could be internet, right? But let's say it's a uh, cable TV signal coming in from the city from outside, and it has a certain strength. Let's say 30 dBs uh, or whatever it is. Okay, let's it has a certain strength, and it contains all the channels at once. All the channels are present there all the time. How do you grab the channel? You have a tuner at the other end and you tune to the specific carrier just to grab the frequency, just like you're tuning with your radio in your car, right? except the frequencies in the, uh, for the radio in the car, all the frequencies are present in the air. But in, the cable, in the, this situation here, we have all the frequencies present in the cable. Same thing, but different, right? In a way. Uh, so <clears throat> in order for us to distribute that signal over a certain distance, let's say there's a main bus in the hallway, that the signal has to be over certain strength at the end of that cable. Then we're going to use something that's called the RF amplifier, radio frequency amplifier or distribution, distribution amplifier. We're going to have to bump it up a little bit so it has a strength to travel that to that cable, through that cable to, towards the end. Right. Now, so we have the input and we have the amplified output and how um, are we going to control the amplification, which would be through the gain, it's just like a volume control on the radio, right? So that would be the gain control. And we can talk about the tilt a little bit later. And then, of course, you got, you're going, because the signal is a certain strength, and if you wanted to tap that into your TV straight, it's going to be way too strong for that TV um, television set. You're going to have a test put, test, um, test um, tap out, all right? And you see, whatever is here, it's going to be minus like 20 decibels less just so the signal is not as strong uh, so it doesn't burn the circuitry or is not being displayed properly so that would be the test kind of an output and this will be input so you can see what's coming on the input and then over here you have the output but also is lowered 20 dbs so you can see uh if uh well if this thing works we have things on the input we have things on the output good everybody's happy are we well not yet Remember this table here, as the frequencies travel, or the frequencies increase, the signal is not as strong. So the signal that contains different frequencies is going to be attenuated in the cable, but the frequencies that are present are not going to be attenuated equally. So you can tell that the low frequencies are going to travel further before becoming unrecognizable than the high frequencies. The high frequencies are going to attenuate quicker. They're going to deteriorate quicker. So how would we remedy that? Well, here is the control that says tilt. And sometimes it's called slope. We adjust the way this amplifier is going to amplify the frequencies by adjusting the tilt of the amplification or the slope of the amplification. So at the go, right at, here at the output, we're going to shoot the frequencies out of all the, all the, all the frequencies that are present. We're going to shoot them, so, shoot them out the output so the higher frequencies are amplified more right from the start than the lower frequencies. And then as the signal travels down the cable, things are going to be equalized a little bit more because at the end, the idea is that uh, the situation is that we have uh, clear frequencies on the low end and we have the clear signal on the higher end frequencies. So that's why we have the tilt here or slope. Okay. All right. And if you're interested, uh, if you want to know more and if you're excited about this kind of topic, you can find out more here. All right, now let's take a quick look. I wonder if we're going to go five or so minutes uh, over. So I'm just going to say, as I always say, uh, if you have to go uh, at the end of whatever the time that we have designated, by all means go, you can catch the end of it uh, later on when I post that on YouTube. All right, so broadband connection. 
broadband internet service here's the terminology that we're going to look at is the most used form of internet access because of its high access speed internet provided to your home or whatever facility is in the form of analog signal right here just like the radio frequencies in your car radio are presented to the radio in an analog form there's no digital um, technology involved we're talking about voltage levels or power levels and whatnot just like the signal from a microphone with direct connection to the preamplifier and then to the amplifier if it's in the simplest form it's an analog form in broadband the internet is offered in different forms four different forms basically we still have something that's called DSL, which stands for Digital Subscribers Line. And that is, that signal is provided over the telephone line. We also have fiber optic, but it's also in a broadband form, which means all the frequencies are present there at all times. The cable, which will be the coaxial cable, and of course through satellite but the internet signal that's coming from outside to your home is in an analog form all the frequencies are present now also what i said the old dial up modem if you know what that is the dial up connection is the only non-broadband internet service available and even though it is cheaper or less expensive most internet users are moving towards the faster broadband connection. Well, I lose the term, I use the term loosely because uh, very rarely you're going to see a dial up connection when it comes to internet. A dial up was popular till like mid 90s and it used a telephone line to connect to the internet, which means you can't use the telephone, the POTS telephone, once it's connected. It's just like pick up the phone, dial a number of the internet provider. The internet provider circuitry picks it up and it gives you a connection to the internet. And it's, you have a connection. It's not as fast as broadband, but you still have the connection. It used to be popular, as I said, towards like mid nineties. Is it still being used? Yes, it is not dead completely, the dial-up connection. It's still being used, and I'll explain to you how. All right. <clears throat> All right. Now, when it comes to Ethernet, the signal type is digital. And the Ethernet, the Ethernet, not the internet, right, is using baseband instead of broadband, which is time division multiplexing. Broadband is using frequency division multiplexing. Next slide. Here on the bottom, you have, you see the example of the broadband multiplexing. And over here, you see TDM, it's just time division multiplexing. What are the differences between these two? The analogy that I used is the old way that the television signal was provided was in the form of broadband. And now the internet also is provided by in the, in the, in the terms of broadband. It's just, just like the television channels, but slightly different, but using the same principle, same idea, having channels based on their frequencies same as you have channels based on the frequencies in your car radio you tune into certain frequencies that are being present in the air in order to catch that station that is transmitted transmitting at certain carrier frequency but in the air all the channels 
provided that the signal is present, you know, the signal can reach from the antenna to the uh, to your car, all the frequencies are present at the same time. You're just tuning into that specific frequency. So you're talking frequency division multiplexing. Multiplexing is, they can call it a discrimination, technical term of discrimination or tuning into a specific signal that you want. And you can tune to that signal in the form of broadband or baseband. Let's concentrate on broadband first. All the frequencies are present. And this is just channel one, channel two, channel, but it could be hundreds of channels. Right? And here is the multiplexer. And here is the demultiplexer. The purpose, the job of the multiplexer is to get all the signals that are provided to that device. And it's going to combine them into one huge type of a signal and shoot them down the pipes, well, through a channel, through a, um, well, what do I mean, not channel, through a cable or through air, if it's antenna, or through the fiber optics. But it is going to just mix them up, combine them, and basically transmit them. The job of the multiplexer is to discriminate the different channels, to find them. And if that particular receiver wants to tune in to a specific channel at that time, then the multiplex is the multiplexer can find that frequency and output the signal to that specific user. So that's the broadband. All frequencies, all channels are present at all times. Which means you're going to have for this, if, it's, if you're going to use a cable for that, you're going to have to, to use the cable with huge bandwidth in order to fit all the content in that one cable. Now, let's take a look at the time division multiplexing. Here's a signal one, here's a signal two, signal three, and signal four, just to mention a few. Right. Here's a multiplexer, and here's a demultiplexer, and they're connected with a link. Now, the time division multiplexing works slightly different than the broadband multiplexing. In order for these two work to work together, they have to be time synchronized. So the multiplexer is going to receive different signals, whatever they are, and it is going to chop them in time and maybe at one second it is going to transmit signal a and another second is going to transmit signal b and another second signal c and another time signal d and it's going to keep repeating that it's going to switch it's just like if you had a wheel with a like, dial so only one channel is being transmitted through this link at any given time. And at the same time that the multiplexer is transmitting the signal, that demultiplexer is going to have to be synchronized so it can receive those channels one at a time in the time that is divided in the same way that this one is dividing the time and the same way that this thing is dividing the time. So it can also receive the chunks of different channels, chunks of the signal. Now, 
in order for this thing to work properly, this multiplexing here, the time division multiplexing, has to happen extremely fast. To the point that if, for example, if there's a telephone conversation and that person here is connected to that person here, the time of switching happens so fast that when this person talks, this person is going to hear just as if that person was connected with a straight wire. But the speed is the key of the equipment. Now, because we only are transmitting one signal at a time, one channel at a time, this data link doesn't have to have a huge bandwidth, as in this case. Because it doesn't have to contain all the channels at any given time. It has to be just enough to transmit one channel comfortably, but the timing is being used here. And this thing here is this multiplexer is transmitting the channels and switching between the channels very fast. And that demultiplexer is receiving those channels, those chunks of the channels also very fast, but the timings have to be synchronized in order for that to work, all right? So here's the difference between the broadband and the basement transmission. So let's take a quick look at, and then we're going to end this here. Um, in broadband, connections are divided into channels. In basement, there's no channel division. Okay. Oh, of course. Now the phone has to ring. Okay, now, in broadband, each channel occupies a space within the sp all the spectrum that the medium or the cable can handle. And in this case here in baseband, each communication link occupies all the bandwidth that the media can, hand, can handle for one channel. So this has to handle all the channels at the same time. This only has to be enough. It has to have enough bandwidth to handle one channel because time division is used here. All channels are injected into the medium at the same time with broadband and in baseband, each communication link waits its turn to talk in a time sharing manner. But because it happens very fast, then we can accomplish the communication between different channels. Now, communication between devices is established in broadband. Communication between devices is established through a tuning to a specific frequency and then getting channel out of it, the signal out of it. There's no tuning involved. The only tuning that is involved is that the carrier and this carrier here is just tuned once and then there's no switching when it comes to tuning. So that's the only thing, right? So no tuning switching is involved because the signals are not assigned to channels as far as frequencies. So this we call frequency division multiplexing. And this here, we are involved with time division multiplexing. So broadband is using frequency division multiplexing, baseband is using time division multiplexing. Right. Now, there's one more slide here, or a couple more slides. Remember uh, when I was talking to you about dial-up connection? So this is how dial-up connection would work. And you can still buy these uh, US robotics modems, dial-up modems, there'll be different uh, kinds in long time ago, before some of you were born. Um, so what happens here if this uh, computer wants to connect to the provider? So here's a phone line and well, there's a computer, it's connected to a modem. That modem is connected to a phone line through the phone line and the local exchange, which will be the telephone providing provision company. 
uh, the modem would dial a phone number. That thing would, uh, the switching circuitry and the telephone company would connect you to a certain local exchange and that would connect you to whatever the facility is that has that phone number. That automatic circuitry would pick it up, connect, and you have a connection through a phone line. And obviously, because the phone line's bandwidth is not as great as the cable's bandwidth, you couldn't transmit the signals very fast. But uh, at the time uh, when this was popular, <clears throat> all the other um, services were adjusted accordingly to the, uh, you know, to the type of signals that were being used. So um, sometimes you would take, you know, two or five minutes to load up one picture that right now you click on a picture and bang, there it is, right? Uh, so that's, that was the difference between then and now, right? So what did I write here? Dial-up internet access is a form of internet access that uses the facilities to public switch, switch telephone networks. Uh, so public switch telephone networks, PSTN, to establish a connection to an internet service provider, ISP, internet service provider, by dialing a telephone number on a conventional telephone, like dial up connection use, uh, connections use modems to decode the audio signal because that's kind of, well, yeah, it's transmitted into the, uh, converted to audio signal. Uh, and you can actually hear that blurb or jip, jitter uh, uh, with all dial up connections. Uh, so dial up connections use modems to decode audio signal into data and send to a router or computer and encode the signals from da 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 da. So signal is converted to audio um, jitter and then audio jitter is received and it's translated into a data signal and that's how things. So things are slow here. Why am I mentioning this? This thing is still being used. It's not used as much, but still in some crucial um, scenarios, those dial-up modems are being used as backup service. So let me explain to you how. The backup service will be the backup internet provider service. Let's say you have a, well, um, store in retail business, store. And that store has, let's say five or six cash registers. All those cash registers have their, well, the logic kind of equipment uh, such as, well, the cash register is basically in the form of PC right now. It's a computer with a drawer for the money and the display used a certain way with the software written to it. So it acts like a cash register. So all the transactions uh, are basically stored, remember, through the VPN connection to some kind of a central facility that records all the data and manipulates whichever way it does. So the cash registers are connected to the main facility, whatever it is, through the VPN, through a network, through a computer network, through the ethernet. And when the network works, everything is fine. Uh, the transactions at all six cash registers are happening and everybody is happy. Also, what happens is that the, well, the money machines, so would be the money machines. By, by, by that, I call the, uh, well, uh, the, well, I don't want to use any brands names because you know, I'm going to publish that. Uh, there will be the money transaction machine. So be the, the, the device that uh, takes your credit card or debit card. Right? And that also is independently and dependently can synchronize with the whole the cash register, but it has an independent connection to the network for the transaction to be to be to be done. So that cash register with the money machine is they're all connected through the network and things are happening. What happens if the network goes down? So the internet can go down, you know, there could be some sort of uh, thing down the road that happens that the internet is cut off. Or sometimes the, the well, part of the equipment fails and there's no internet service. So what do you have to do? Are you going to close the store 
Well, you don't have to because quite often what's being used, that there's a backup modem, dial-up modem is being implemented here. So when the network goes down and sometimes or quite often or most of the time or maybe like pretty much 100% of the time, that connection switch switches to the dial-up modem. And because the dial-up modem is not as fast as the whatever else, the network, like the broadband um, is provided, the connection is slower. So what happens is that all other cache registers are being shut down. And there's that one designated for emergencies cache register that is going to operate. So then when somebody makes a transaction, wants to use a debit card, it's going to take much longer because that thing goes through that modem. The modem dials up the bank or whatever the provider is, makes a connection, makes a transaction, hangs up the phone, and the transaction is done. So things are going to move slower and you're not going to have all six cache registers open, you're just going to have one, but at least you can keep the store open until the network connection has been restored. Okay, and this was the last uh, slide for, for today. Um, I'm going to upload this uh, by the end of this week, this whole presentation, so uh, you can analyze it. And remember, um, uh, for the class of 2023 uh, network cabling, there is going to be no um, no theory next week because we're going to ha have the test, online test, and uh, same as it was. Okay, I'm talking too much now. Cool, guys. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I will see you next time whenever I see you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day, sir. Hey. <laughs>